I'd like to introduce a very special guest here tonight. Her name is Ilda Salazar, and she's a longtime advocate of workers' rights and environmental protection in Mexico. Now she's working with a thought in Mexico, the Authentic Labor Front, which is the largest independent labor organization in Mexico, no small feat in a country dominated by labor unions that are dominated by the, the corrupt government of Mexico. She's also now working with the Mexican Action Network on Free Trade, which is a coalition of over 100 organizations, labor, environmental, and other popular organizations that are working to define what free trade should mean and working to negotiate those trade policies throughout the hemisphere. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming our special guest tonight, Ilda Salazar. Good evening. I would first of all like to thank MIT and the compañeras from casa for having invited me, inviting me to um, address you on this occasion. Que es un tiempo muy importante porque estamos entrando a la recta final de aprobación del NAFTA. This is a very important time because we're starting in the final approval process of NAFTA. Pero también porque me siento muy honrado en compartir el auditorio. Because uh, also because I feel very honored to share this auditorium. Del maestro Chomsky. With Professor Chomsky. Quisiera yo hablar de un punto de vista diferente al del gobierno mexicano en relación al Tratado de Libre Comercio. I want to speak about a different viewpoint than the Mexican government has with relation to the North American Free Trade Agreement. Y expresarles que hay una parte de la sociedad mexicana que no estamos de acuerdo con los términos actuales de ese tratado. And express to you that there is a part of Mexican society that is not in agreement with the terms of that accord. Yo pertenezco a una red de organizaciones sociales I belong to a network of social organizations que tenemos dos años trabajando en torno a NAFTA. and we have been working for two years with regard to NAFTA. The first thing that we tried to do was try to find out what was happening with the, the Commerce Accord. Cuando los gobiernos de Estados Unidos, México y Canadá anunciaron que se firmaría, se entraría en una negociación de un tratado de libre comercio. When the governments of the United States, Canada and Mexico announced that they were going to start a dialogue about a free trade agreement. Y que fue dado con gran publicidad en nuestro país. Which was um, greeted with great publicity in our country. Al mismo tiempo empezamos a carecer de información concreta. At the same time we started to suffer from a great lack of information. El grueso de las negociaciones del tratado fueron hechas en secreto. The majority of the negotiations were uh, done in secret. Acompañadas de una gran publicidad, pero carentes del contenido concreto de lo que se estaba negociando. They were accompanied by a great deal of publicity which totally lacked content about what was being negotiated. Por eso una de las primeras críticas que nosotros hacemos a este tratado. That's why one of our first criticisms of this uh, treaty es que no cuenta con un consenso social is that it doesn't have a social consensus ni de la sociedad de Estados Unidos, ni de Canadá y tampoco de México from Ameri US society or Canadian society or Mexican society either en la búsqueda de esta información nosotros entramos en contacto con grupos de Canadá in search for this information we have entered into contact with groups from Canada y ellos nos contaron su experiencia en la firma de un tratado de libre comercio entre Estados Unidos y Canadá and they told us about their experience with regard to the signing of the treaty between Canada uh, and the United States, the, the, the free trade agreement. Y ellos confirmaron que gran parte de la sociedad canadiense había sido afectada por ese tratado. And they confirmed to us that a great part of uh, Canadian society was affected by that agreement. Particularmente en lo que se refiere a sus empleos. Especially with regard to their jobs. Pero también en relación al medio ambiente. But also with regard to the environment. Y empezamos entonces una lucha por tratar de conocer cuáles eran las negociaciones del tratado e influir en sus decisiones. So we started to begin a struggle to understand the content of what was being negotiated in the treaty and to have an effect 
on those negotiations. El Tratado de Libre Comercio para México empezó a adquirir más y más importancia. The um, North American Free Trade Agreement started to uh, have more and more importance. Ahí a estas alturas se ha convertido en la política macroeconómica más importante del gobierno de Salinas. And at this point, it has become the most important macroeconomic uh, uh, politics or policy of the Salinas government. No fue sino hasta año y medio después que nosotros pudimos acceder a un borrador del tratado. It was not until a year and a half after it started that we could even get a rough draft of of the treaty y que nos fue proporcionado por compañeros de Estados Unidos y Canadá which was given to us by our uh, colleagues in the United States and Canada de parte del gobierno mexicano no hemos podido todavía obtener información we have still haven't been able to get information from the Mexican government por lo tanto consideramos que este acuerdo no solo no consultó organizaciones sociales sino a otros sectores importantes de la sociedad that's why we think that this accord um, did not only um, uh, consult with um, the popular organizations but uh, with society in general una vez que conocimos su contenido realizamos críticas al mismo once we found out about the content of the accords or of the agreement we made criticisms of said um, accords Pensamos que el Tratado de Libre Comercio va a beneficiar fundamentalmente al capital transnacional. We think that the free trade agreement is principally going to benefit um, multinational capital. Toda vez que no ha tomado en cuenta las grandes diferencias que existen entre nuestro país y Estados Unidos y Canadá. It hasn't taken into account the great differences between our society and that of the United States and Canada. Los pequeños y medianos industriales en México están preocupados también por el tratado. Small and medium sized entrepreneurs in Mexico are also very worried about the, the treaty. Porque ellos no están preparados ni tecnológica ni con capital ni con capacitación suficiente para competir con estos capitales transnacionales. Because they are not prepared with capital or with training or technology to compete with these transnational uh, corporations. Y es posible entonces que el empleo de el que se habla que se va a crear en México con el Tratado de Libre Comercio and it's possible then that the jobs that they're talking about which are being, going to be created with this free trade vaya acompañado también de grandes tasas de desempleo por estas industrias que van a quebrar will be accompanied by great unemployment uh, on, in these industries that are going to go broke de hecho en nuestro país durante este año han cerrado gran número de empresas manufactureras In fact, this year, many manufacturing companies in our country have closed. Porque no tienen suficiente calidad para competir con los productos que entran del extranjero. Because of lack of ability uh, or of quality standards to compete with products that come in from the exterior. Otro asunto que nos pareció crucial en relación al texto del tratado es lo que se refiere a la agricultura. Another crucial point which we considered uh, in the uh, agreement had to do with agriculture. Fue pedido por muchas organizaciones campesinas que los granos básicos como el frijol y el maíz no entraran en la negociación del tratado. Many campesino organizations, peasant organizations, uh, asked or had the opinion that the issue of um, basic grains, uh, beans and rice should not uh, be included in the, uh, the dialogue for the agreement. Porque se trata de un problema de autosuficiencia alimentaria y para muchos de ellos de subsistencia. Because it's a problem of food self-sufficiency and for many of them subsistence. Lo único que se logró en el cuerpo de tratado fue que para esos granos se dieran los plazos más largos que son 15 años. The only thing that was accomplished was that with regard to basic grains there were, there were longer uh, time limits given that is 15 years. El funcionario encargado en México del programa social declaró recientemente The official uh, in Mexico in charge of the social program recently said que, va, que se necesitarían 25 años para sacar al campo del mexicano de la crisis en la que se encuentra. That you would need 25 years to get the Mexican countryside out of the crisis in which it finds itself now. De tal manera que el campesino mexicano va a llegar 10 años tarde al Tratado de Libre Comercio. In such a manner, the campesino from Mexico is going to arrive at the, treaty, uh, the free trade agreement 10 years late. 
en orden para enfrentar el Tratado de Libre Comercio en mi país, la Constitución ha sido cambiada en los últimos dos años. En order to deal with the, the free trade agreement in the last two years in my country, the Constitution has been changed. El Tratado todavía no se aprueba y los cambios ya han sucedido en México. The treaty has still not been approved and the changes have already happened in Mexico. Un cambio muy importante en nuestra legislación fue el artículo 27 que regula la propiedad de los recursos. An uh, important uh, change is in the article 27 with which uh, which deals with um, the uh, la propiedad de los de la tierra, el with agua, land, el land ownership or resource ownership. Esos recursos llamados ejidos estaban eh, en esa legislación en propiedad comunal y no podían ser vendidos ni enajenado. Those properties which are called ejidos, according to the Constitution, could not be sold or expropriated. Eran un patrimonio de la comunidad y ahora esos recursos pueden ser vendidos por la cabeza de familia. They were a common heritage of the community and now those properties can be sold by the head of household. Es probable que las mejores tierras en México sí se vendan. It's very probable that in this way the best lands in Mexico will be sold. Pero las tierras de los estados más pobres van a permanecer en manos de los campesinos sin apoyo oficial. But the lands of the uh, of the poorest provinces will be still in the hands of the campesinos without any official support. Porque la lógica de estas transformaciones es llevar a la eficiencia, a la competitividad, al libre mercado, la producción de el campo mexicano. Because the rationale is to bring to uh, to free trade, to com competit competitiveness, the uh, Mexican economy. En cambio, el Tratado de Libre Comercio sí protegió los intereses de los grandes capitales en el capítulo de propiedad intelectual. But, on the other hand, the free trade agreement protected the, the interests of, of big capital in the area of intellectual property. En este capítulo se tuvo mucho cuidado de que los dueños de las patentes, marcas y franquicias no entraran a una libertad y garantizar que la propiedad continuara. In this, in this respect, it was uh, very carefully uh, written that owners of patents, uh, patents y and, and royalties should yes. keep their, their properties. Tampoco considera el cuerpo del Tratado de Libre Comercio suficientemente aspectos sociales. The free trade agreement also does not adequately consider social concerns. Nosotros hemos llamado esto la agenda social que debería estar incluida en el tratado. We call this the social agenda which should be included within the agreement. Un aspecto se refiere a las cuestiones laborales, a los derechos de los trabajadores. One aspect is about labor issues, about workers rights. Otro se refiere al cuidado del medio ambiente. One, another aspect is the environment and care for the environment. Nos parecía que el asunto de migración y de derechos humanos tendría que estar incluido también. We believe also that issues of human rights and immigration should be included as well. Recientemente se abrió la negociación de los acuerdos paralelos con respecto a, de, a, a la cuestión laboral y medio ambiente. Recently, the labor and environment uh, side agreement uh, dialogue or negotiations were opened. Nosotros pensamos que será una oportunidad para incluir estos aspectos que habían sido dejados fuera en el texto del tratado. We thought that this was a wonderful opportunity to deal with these issues which had been left out of the text of the original treaty. El resultado que de estos acuerdos que conocimos el 12 de agosto nos parece totalmente insuficiente. The results of these side agreements which we find, found out about on the 12th of August seems to us completely insufficient. El acuerdo laboral se restringe solo a algunos aspectos. The, the labor agreement is, is narrowed down only to certain limited aspects. Se refiere a cuestiones de salud y seguridad. It's, it only deals with issues of health and security. Trabajo de menores. Um, uh, child labor. Y salario mínimo. And minimum wage. Dejó fuera los derechos esenciales de los trabajadores it, como el derecho de huelga. It left out the essential rights of workers such as the right to strike. El derecho de contratación colectiva. The right to collective bargaining. La libertad sindical. The uh, right of freedom of, of unions. Y en general las condiciones y prestaciones de los trabajadores. In, and in general the issues of conditions of, of workers. Pero además los mecanismos para resolver una controversia en los acuerdos paralelos. 
But the mechanism to resolve controversies within the side agreements es muy complicado y muy burocratizado. Are very complicated and bureaucratic. Y la participación de organizaciones civiles y sindicatos muy restringida. And the, the participation of uh, labor unions and the civilian organizations within that is very restricted. Lo mismo ocurre con el tratado ambiental. The same is, uh, is true with the environmental side agreement. Que contempla muchas disposiciones de carácter general. Which uh, contemplates many uh, very general themes. Que uno podría estar de acuerdo con ellas. Which one could be in agreement with. Pero la posibilidad de que sean aplicadas particularmente en México son muy remotas. But the possibility of their being applied to specific situations in Mexico are very remote. Tan remotas, remotísimas, como dijo el negociador Serrapuche so remote, so infinitely remote that as the um, negotiator named Serrapuche dijo said, que era la aplicación de sanciones en esta materia that it was like application of sanctions in this regard cuando los grupos criticamos que hubieran aceptado sanciones comerciales when, uh, when groups uh, uh, when groups said that we would apply uh, commercial sanctions. Inicialmente el gobierno boycott. mexicano había declarado que no aceptaría sanciones comerciales. The, the Mexican government said that it would not accept um, commercial sanctions. Porque se trataba de un aspecto de soberanía nacional. Because it had to do with an issue of national sovereignty. Finalmente, con la presión de la negociación, el gobierno mexicano aceptó sanciones comerciales. Finally, with the pressure and negotiation, uh, the, the Mexican government uh, agreed to, um, to commercial sanctions. Nosotros pensamos que el cuidado de los derechos laborales y del medio ambiente no es un problema de sanciones, sino de política económica. We believe that the protection of labor rights and environmental rights are not an issue of sanctions, but an issue of, of economics and economic vitality. Nuestra propuesta es que el tratado tal y como está negociado no sea ratificado por el Congreso de Estados Unidos. Our proposal is that the agreement as it is written now not be ratified by the Congress of the United States. Ni por el Senado Mexicano. Nor nor by the Mexican Senate. Que se abra una gran consulta nacional en los tres países. There should be a, a great dialogue or consultation opened in all three countries. Y que los términos de un tratado de libre comercio and the terms of the free trade agreement se ha discutido ampliamente con los sectores de la sociedad. be discussed widely within all sectors of society. No estamos en contra del libre comercio. We are not against free trade. Estamos en contra de la forma como fue negociado. We are against the manner in which it was negotiated. Contaron mucho más los tiempos políticos que las consideraciones de carácter económico y social. It, was, it had more to do with political issues of the time than issues of a social and economic nature. Por ello nuestra propuesta es que no se apruebe este tratado. That's why our proposal is that this treaty not be approved. Pero si no logramos que esto sea posible. But if we do not accomplish this goal. Que los tres países tenemos que luchar por la inclusión de esta agenda social en las relaciones bilaterales y trilaterales. The three countries together, we must work for this agenda, social agenda to be included within the treaty on a bilateral basis as well as a trilateral basis. Finalmente quisiera terminar externando una preocupación del de debate actual en Estados Unidos. Finally, I want to um, end with a, um, a share, to share with you a, um, a preoccupation that I have about the actual debate here within the United States. La, los, los que detractan el tratado, los que piensan que el tratado no debe aprobarse, Those who are against the treaty who believe that it shouldn't be approved están usando la idea de que los trabajadores mexicanos vamos a robar los empleos a los Estados Unidos. Are using the rationale that we the Mexican workers are going to steal jobs from, uh, from the United States. En primer lugar pensamos que las estimaciones han sido exageradas. First of all, we believe that the calculations have been exaggerated. Tanto de pérdida de empleo de ustedes como de creación de empleo de nosotros. Calculations about loss of jobs here as 
as well as calculations about the gain of jobs on, from us on, on our part. Pero que han sido usados argumentos de corte racista y muy proteccionista. There have been arguments um, lodged which are very racist and very protectionist. Tanto por ciertos grupos que están a favor como en contra del tratado. By groups who are against as well as for the agreement. Estamos aquí para comunicar que pensamos que podemos dar una lucha conjunta. We are here to communicate to you that we believe that we can um, forge a struggle together. Y encontrar relaciones entre los tres países que sean benéficos para nuestros pueblos. And find there, thereby find relations within the three countries that will be beneficial to all of our peoples. Estamos por una integración que contemple los intereses de los trabajadores de los tres países. We are gracias. for an integration that contemplates the interests of workers in all three countries. Thank you very much. Casa will be traveling this week with Dale de Salazar to different places in the eastern Massachusetts area to bring that lost message to people and to the media here. Some places you might go would be to the IUE Local 201 tomorrow in Lynn or to Tufts University in the evening to get a more in-depth look at the environmental implications of both NAFTA and other free trade policies. Before I go any further, I'd like to invite Grant up to the podium. <laughs> so I'll welcome Grant to the podium. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm, I'm from the Thistle and we reserved the room for, uh, for this event and I just wanted I wanted to say that, uh, that we recognize how important it is for forums like this to be held at MIT, how important it is for the MIT community and for the broader community. And we're going to work to keep MIT open to the Cambridge community and to energize the MIT community with the voices that are being heard tonight. Thank you. and MIT Initiative for Peace have both been very supportive of CASA's work in the past and of all progressive causes here in the area. The Thistle is an incredible university progressive paper and it's not just for students at MIT and it's widely available at locations, well what can I think of it's available? I get it at the Harvest Food Co-op and you could also ask Rand or somebody else from the Thistle here where you can get that newspaper, it's incredible. So thanks again to the Thistle for helping us get this room this evening. And now I'd like to introduce you to you the man who really I think needs no introduction. Noam Chomsky is one of the brilliant minds of our time, not on one issue but on a variety of issues. Here at MIT he's a professor of linguistics and has done groundbreaking work in that field. Many of us though know him for his analysis on U.S. imperialism in Central America, in the Middle East and throughout the globe. We know him for his analysis about the media, his analysis that helps us to evaluate what the media covers and why they cover what they cover and why they leave out what they leave out. Many of us know him for, him for his writings, Manufacturing Consent, Year 501, The, Con the Conquest Continues, and now many of us know him, uh, him because he's a film star. Manufacturing Consent, again, is a, is a film that puts together many of the ideas of Noam Chomsky. And if you haven't seen it, I strongly encourage you to watch that film. On behalf of CASA, I'm very honored to welcome Noam Chomsky here tonight. CASA is very grateful that Noam Chomsky, again, has agreed to do a benefit for CASA and to talk about the issues that are very important to CASA and to the hemisphere. Please join me in welcoming Noam Chomsky.
kind of disappointed that you didn't mention the achievement that I'm most proud of. I got on the back of a punk rock record, sharing it with uh, Bad Religion. I thought that was funny. <laughs> uh, when I'm uh, asked to talk about topics like tonight's topic, at least what the topic that was announced in the thistle, where I get all my information from, uh, <laughs> as everyone should, uh, uh, democracy and free trade, the, uh, the first thing that comes to mind almost inevitably is a story about Mahatma Gandhi, uh, who was asked once uh, what he thought about Western civilization. And he thought for a while, and he answered that he thought it might be a good idea. Uh, and I, I have no idea whether the story is true or not, but it's, it's a nice story anyway. Uh, and it certainly applies to the question of free trade and democracy. They might, in fact, be good ideas. Uh, the, there has, over the centuries, been a, an expansion of democratic participation. In my opinion, it's been it's stopped, and it's being reversed. Uh, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I think it would be a good idea to press forward with that project, which is now in great, have facing great problems around the world, I think. Uh, with regard to free trade, uh, there's, we're basically talking about nothing. Nobody's in favor of free trade except for maybe somebody else, uh, because then you can plunder them better if they accept those rules. Uh, surely no developing society has ever, uh, developed society has ever followed such rules, including the United States, ever in the past or in the present. Uh, as for the uh, a North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, that might be a good idea. Uh, but uh, NAFTA has nothing to do with that, or almost nothing to do with that. It is North American, that's true. Uh, it's North American, but it's not free. It's not about free interactions, not about trade, and it certainly uh, doesn't have much agreement behind it. In fact, the populations of uh, the country seem to be overwhelmingly against it. So a, Nor a North American free trade agreement might be something interesting to talk about, uh, and democracy is certainly interesting to talk about, and the connections between democracy and free trade uh, are also worth talking about, but now we'd be, you know, like some academic seminar about some you know, topic that doesn't exist. Uh, the, uh, 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 in the real world, things are a little different. Now, it's not that democracy and free trade aren't uh, words that are bandied about constantly. They certainly are. Uh, for example, if you uh, subject yourselves, as I do for some masochistic reason, to reading the New York Times every morning, uh, the last couple of days have been full of, uh, last week have been full of discussion of uh, something called the New Clinton Doctrine. Uh, the uh, New Clinton Doctrine, surely uh, it's all about uh, free trade and uh, democracy. If you read, uh, there was a major speech given by the National Security Advisor, Anthony Lake, a lot of articles about it and so on. Uh, uh, apparently something really important is going on to judge by the headlines, uh, headlines like U.S. vision of foreign policy reversed, you know, not just modified, but actually reversed. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, the doctrine, the new Clinton doctrine, is certain, certainly involves a, at least a rhetorical commitment to democracy and free trade. The, it, opens, it opens as follows. It says, uh, I'll well quote the actual word, uh, throughout the Cold War, we contained a global threat to market democracies. Now we should seek to enlarge their reach. Okay, so that's the reversal. Up until now, we were containing a global threat to democracy and free trade. Now we are going to enlarge the reach of democracy and free trade. The key words to remember for those of you who want to get jobs and things is that we used to believe in containment, and now we believe in enlargement. That's the reversal. <laughs> well, uh, it's an interesting comment. We can try to evaluate it. Uh, uh, and a rational person would know exactly how to do it. Uh, so a rational person who wanted to find out, say, and let's begin with the first part. Throughout the Cold War, we contained a global threat to market democracies. Uh, a person, a rational person who wanted to find out, say, what uh, pre-Gorbachev Russia was doing during the Cold War uh, would begin by asking what they did do. 
uh, for example, specifically in regions that were under their influence and control. So you want to find out what they were trying to do, you look at what they did do in Eastern Europe, for example. That tells you what they're trying to do, if you're rational. Uh, similarly, a rational person who's trying to figure out what the United States was trying to do through the Cold War, throughout the Cold War, would take a look at what it did do, particularly in areas which are under its influence and domination. Well, that's a much wider arena for us than it is for pre-Gorbachev Russia, uh, but there's plenty of evidence in it, and there are some parts that are uh, uh, plainly decisive to answer these questions, certainly for a rational person. Uh, the obvious place to look is Latin America, uh, which has been almost totally under our domination and control with no interfering factors uh, uh, since Second World War and for the Caribbean region from far beyond that. So that's where you would look to find out about our, uh, uh, con our containing a global threat to uh, a democracy and uh, 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 markets. Uh, so for example, start with just the, the most important case. The most important country in Latin America, the biggest, the richest, and so on, is Brazil. Uh, and according to this doctrine then, uh, when the Kennedy administration uh, dedicated itself to overthrowing the parliamentary government in Brazil, uh, in, uh, in the early 1960s, and then the Johnson administration picked it up, instituting a, a regime of uh, neo-Nazi fascist torturers and killers, a national security state. The reason they did that uh, was because they wanted to defend democracy and uh, uh, markets. That's what we're uh, told to believe. Uh, and in fact, uh, that's pretty much what was believed, or at least what was said. So for example, Kennedy's uh, Kennedy's ambassador, Lincoln Gordon, uh, when the generals took over, uh, said that this he praised what he called this democratic revolution, uh, which he called a great victory for the free world. Uh, in fact, the single most decisive victory of freedom in the mid-20th century. Uh, this is while the torturers and the killers were uh, very visibly at work. Uh, he also added another line which helps explain what this is about. Uh, he said that this is a, a great victory for the free world, which should create a greatly improved climate for foreign investment. Uh, well, that uh, suggests something. In fact, it did create a greatly improved climate for foreign investment. Uh, uh, it, it, to call it a victory for freedom and democracy requires a rather special understanding of those words. Uh, as the uh, fascist terror was imposed with greater violence and destruction in Brazil in the following years, Brazil became, I'm quoting, the uh, Latin American darling of the business community. That's quoting the business press, and it's quite accurate. Uh, it is true that there were some reservations about the sadistic violence with which the uh, improvement in uh, the investment climate was being carried out, but it was indeed the Latin American darling of the business community. There was nothing particularly new about that. The same had been true about Mussolini's Italy and about Hitler Germany. So in the 1920s, uh, when uh, the black shirts took over Italy, they were highly praised also for carrying out a great democratic, a great rev uh, revolution that we highly praised. A decade later, President Roosevelt praised the uh, admirable Italian gentleman who'd carried it out, uh, the uh, destroying the labor movement and eliminating the parliamentary system, uh, uh, instituting uh, uh, torture and terror, uh, but improving investment opportunities, no question. In fact, U.S. investment in Italy just shot up in the 1920s. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, the business press was absolutely rhapsodic about it. Uh, in, in Fortune magazine uh, in around 1932 actually had a full uh, uh, issue devoted to it, uh, which was had on the front cover a big slogan, the WAPs are unwapping themselves. Uh, the WAPs are finally getting something right. You know, that's uh, the idea. Uh, when Hitler came along in the 1930s, he too was lauded. Uh, we had to support him as a barrier to as a, a barrier to communist takeover, and in fact, American business investment in Germany uh, boomed through the 1930s. It leveled in the rest. It declined in most of the rest of Europe. Leveled in England. Uh, greatly expanded in uh, Germany uh, because Nazi Germany was the darling of the uh, business community. Uh, so there's nothing novel about the support for the British for the Brazilian. 
uh, uh, neo-Nazis, uh, uh, both the attempt to, to, inst to institute a uh, neo-Nazi military coup that would eliminate the parliamentary regime under Kennedy, and then the support for it in later years. Uh, well, Brazil's a particularly interesting case. Uh, for one thing, it's the biggest and richest country in uh, Latin America. It's a country with enormous prospects and has tremendous advantages, uh, enormous resources, no foreign enemies, uh, uh, wonderful relations with the major sources of capital. Uh, it's been under firm U.S. control for about almost 50 years now, so it had the advantages of our guidance and tutelage. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, you can find out a lot about us by seeing what happened there. Uh, from some, if you look at the numbers, it looks pretty successful. It has one of the fastest growth rates in the world, in fact. Uh, if you look at profits for foreign investors, they're fantastic. Uh, if you keep to somewhere, something like, say, 5 or 10% of the population of Brazil, looks great, too. They live like rich, you know, Western Europeans and New Yorkers. If you bother looking at the other 80% or so, well, you know, sort of down in Central Africa. In fact, this super rich country with extraordinary advantages uh, was ranked recently by the uh, UN report on human development in 80th place, uh, right next to Albania and Paraguay. Well, uh, what developed in Brazil is in fact what develops under the particular form of market democracy that we have uh, uh, advocated and in fact instituted, namely a two-tiered society radically split uh, between a small sector linked to international business and investors, which does very nicely, uh, and a huge mass of essentially superfluous people who survive as they can in Brazil not very well. Uh, hundreds of thousands of children die of starvation every year. Uh, medical researchers in Brazil have identified what they regard as a new species, 40% the brain size of humans. Uh, at, after actually generations of starvation. These are in perfectly fertile areas, uh, except where the land is uh, monopolized for agro-export in accordance with the most best approved neoliberal model. Uh, and if anybody tries to get into it, there's always the security forces to keep them out. Uh, Brazil wins many prizes, for example, in murder of street children by the security forces, in child slavery, uh, in uh, 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 if you can believe Brazilian authorities were investigating this in uh, 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 killing of children for the purposes of organ transplant, as is very firmly believed, I should say, by uh, uh, analysts there, although it's a little hard to believe. Uh, but it's, in, in many respects, it's doing very nicely, and it tells us a lot about ourselves. In fact, if you look at the uh, monographic literature in Brazil, it's regarded as a success. Uh, so, for example, the um, senior historian of the CIA, uh, Gerald Haynes, has a highly regarded monograph that came out about a year or two ago where he calls this, a, uh, he points out that when the U.S. took over Brazil in 1945, it was going to be a testing area for scientific methods of development, uh, and we we're going to show them how to do things. Uh, and, uh, and, he, and writing in 1989, he says this is a, a grand success story for American capitalism. Worked out just the way we want it. So for a rational person would look at that and say, well, that tells us something about uh, the way we've been containing a global threat to market democracies uh, throughout the Cold War. Uh, well, perhaps uh, Brazil is unusual for some reason. So we could look at other cases, like we could look at how we defended democracy in Guatemala or Chile and a whole list of other places, and I won't waste your time on it because you know what we'll find. Uh, we can look at uh, other things, which are in a way even more revealing and not quite so much on the surface. So two or three a couple of days ago, I think two or three days ago, I forgot, the World Bank came out with a new report on Latin America, uh, which was uh, quite ominous from their point of view. Uh, they predicted it's heading for a disaster. If you read the, you know, the business pages, they're euphoric about the great growth in the stock market and so on. Uh, but the World Bank found something else. They found that Latin America has the worst record of inequality uh, in the world. Uh, nothing, no other country area comes close. Uh, and in fact, they predict that this is going to lead to chaos and uh, destruction unless governments intervene somehow to do something about it. Well, why does Latin America have the worst uh, record of inequality in the world, meaning the sharpest 
uh, division of this two-tiered society between the tiny sector, sector of very rich and the mass of very poor. Certainly Mexico is a perfect example of this. The economic miracle in Mexico in the last 10 years, uh, is, is, economic miracle is a technical term, which means the macroeconomic statistics look nice and the population is dying. Uh, that's what's called an economic miracle, and Mexico is an example. Uh, the part of the economic miracle that very much impresses uh, foreign investors uh, and uh, uh, industrialists is, for example, that they managed to knock the uh, uh, um, wages down about 60 percent. The labor share of income uh, in Mexico over the economic miracle has gone down by, you know, probably 25 percent or something like that. And the stock market, in fact, is doing great, except 95% of the shares are owned by 8,000 people, of whom 1,500 are foreigners. Uh, well, you know, that's the two-tiered third world model. Very successful, but the World Bank is worried because the radical uh, 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 maldistribution of wealth, which has become far more serious in recent years, they think is going to have chaotic effects. Uh, why did that happen? Is it something in the Latin American genes, perhaps, hence not a consequence of the fact that we've been essentially running that place for throughout the Cold War? Well, you can get the answer to that, too, but here you have to look a little harder. Uh, the U.S. took over Latin America I mean, in 1945, literally took it over. Uh, finally, the U.S. was able, powerful enough in 1945 to achieve the goals of the Monroe Doctrine. Before that, it had been mostly words, except for the local region. Uh, that meant we had to throw out our enemies. Our enemies were Britain and France. We kicked them out. Uh, and we took it over for ourselves and, as Haynes says, turned it into a testing area for scientific methods of development by the methods of capitalism and markets with the results you see. Well, exactly after we kicked out the French and British, there was still uh, you know, a lot of other people to worry about, those guys who lived down there. And they happened to have some ideas of their own. Uh, their ideas were described, in fact, by uh, the state, U.S. State Department in internal records, now, of course, declassified. Uh, and the State Department was much concerned about what was going on in the minds of the peons down there. Uh, because they were, the governments were, who are by no means radical, I should say, but nevertheless the governments were committed to what the State Department called the philosophy of the new nationalism, or otherwise called economic nationalism. And the principles of the philosophy of new nationalism were uh, that governments should work for improvement of production for domestic needs, for broader distribution of wealth, uh, for raising of the standard of living of the masses, uh, and should adopt the principle that the first benefit, the, pr the main, the first beneficiaries of the nation's wealth should be its own population. Those are quotes. Uh, that's the philosophy of the new nationalism, and obviously that won't do. They got the wrong idea. They don't understand uh, the principles of economic rationalism that you sort of learn in your economics courses. Uh, the right principles are were presented in the U.S. proposal called an Economic Charter for the Americas, uh, which said that one we must end economic nationalism in all its forms meaning the first beneficiaries of a nation's wealth are foreign investors, not the people of that country. Uh, no nonsense about distribution of labor, uh, of wealth. Uh, no priorities for development for internal needs and so on. Rather, we follow the uh, sacred doctrines of comparative advantage and international spe specialization. And it's easy to prove a theorem if you've gone to places like MIT that says that the total efficiency of uh, production increases if Brazil develops in a way which is complementary to the United States. In other words, we should produce the manufacturers and the steel and so on, and they should put out, you know, have, give us raw materials and, and cheap labor, and maybe they can do some industrial work, but only the kind that doesn't interfere with us, like, you know, steel industry, but on kind of stuff we're not that much interested in. Interestingly, they were allowed to compete with uh, Europe and Canada. That wasn't against the techniques, the, the uh, principles of economic rationalism, but that had to be complementary to us. And in particular, no economic nationalism, none of these uh, irrational ideas about the first beneficiaries of the 
uh, uh, development programs in a country being the people of that country because they're obviously the foreign investors. Uh, well, the results of all of that, those programs, the United States, of course, won that conflict. Our power was overwhelming. Uh, and uh, the end re one of the end results uh, is given to you in the World Bank report several days ago, namely the worst income distribution in the world, because that's exactly what we instituted, policies leading to that in the economic charter for the Americas in February 1945 in a hemispheric meeting in Mexico. Well, uh, the, uh, um, you might ask whether any of this has changed uh, throughout this whole period. It is certainly true that we have sought a particular style of market economy, particular style, certainly not democracy, I'll drop that. Uh, but you might suppose one were to argue, well, you know, that's just ancient history. Uh, when the Clinton administration is talking about what we've done throughout the Cold War, they really mean, say, the last few years. Uh, so one can look, say, at the 1980s. Uh, how, did we, uh, develop, how did we protect uh, market democracies in our domains in the 1980s? Uh, our domains, again, the obvious place to look is Latin America, though I should say everything I'm saying generalizes worldwide. It just gets more complicated when you move to places where the United States wasn't completely free to do anything it wanted, and there were some conflicting problems we had to worry about. So you want to look at a pure case, clear case, what we really are, you look at Latin America, if you're rational. Uh, well, instead of giving you my opinion about uh, our attitudes toward democracy in the 80s, let me quote, uh, see how it looks like uh, uh, from the point of view of a Reagan insider, a State Department, a Reagan official in the State Department, who has written, in fact, quite extensively. One of the main people has written on uh, U.S. Uh, efforts to uh, bring democracy to Latin America under the Reagan administration, Thomas Carruthers of the State Department, who was uh, a, a Reagan official with regard for Latin America through the 1980s. Uh, and uh, actually, what he writes is very good. I recommend it. Uh, he finds, and honest also, he finds a correlation between U.S. influence and democracy. Indeed, there is a correlation, sharply negative. That is, the greater, and he says so, the greater U.S. influence, the less the democracy. So there was a democratizing development in Latin America down in the southern cone where our influence was least. Uh, but, uh, and furthermore, the Reagan administration was opposed to it and tried to block it, finally sort of went along with it when it was happening anyway. On the other hand, in the places where our influence was strong, uh, the uh, uh, move was quite in the opposite direction, as he points out, an attack on democracy in any meaningful sense, at least. Uh, and he then draws a more general conclusion. Uh, he says that the United States did adopt pro-democracy policies but as a means of relieving pressure for more radical change, and it inevi inevitably sought only limited top-down forms of democratic change that did not risk upsetting the traditional structures of power with which the United States has long been allied. Okay, that tells you what, that's true, you know, tells you what democracy is. Democracy means you keep the structure of power, you keep the guys in charge who are going to create a good climate for business operations, and that's democracy. That's what makes Boris Yeltsin a Democrat when he throws out the Constitution and so on, uh, because he's a Democrat in just this sense. He's, keeping, he's in helping impose a top-down structure of power, uh, which will, in fact, do things like improving, they, think, they hope at least, improving the climate for business opportunity. That makes him a Democrat. Uh, and in that sense, in the sense that Carruthers describes, it's indeed true that uh, we're, we've been defend, protecting democracy and containing the threat to it uh, throughout the Cold War years. Uh, I haven't said anything yet about this global threat that we've been containing, and we can look at that in Latin America too. So take, say, again, Brazil. Uh, uh, U.S. intelligence, of course, was much concerned about communist infiltration. They never could find any Russians. Uh, if you look through the intelligence record, the, the, the Russians weren't trying to get in as if it, were, it would have been possible for them to get in. Uh, so they never found any Russians. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you look through the whole hemisphere, that generalizes. Uh, the only time the Russians are visibly there are, are, is when we virtually invited them in. Uh, if you attack some country and you try to destroy it, uh, people there are going to seek some help somewhere, and inevitably they're going to turn to the Russians. Uh, so in that sense, the Russians were there, an equivalent of, uh, say, Anthony Lake and other people who talk about the 
global threat of the Russians, a Soviet equivalent of that uh, would be somebody who would write, for example, that in Afghanistan, uh, the United States was defending freedom and democracy from the global threat of American imperialism, uh, using as a basis for that the fact that the United States, for its own cynical reasons, supported resistance to the Russian aggression, just as the Russians, for their own cynical reasons, supported uh, resistance to U.S. attack. That's the only sense in which there was any global threat uh, in uh, Latin America. Well, what about the matter of indigenous communists? Uh, here, there's a lot more to say. Uh, for example, you might raise questions about why suppressing indigenous communists has anything to do with protecting democracy. But putting that aside, uh, what you have to ask is, the first question to ask is exactly what is meant when people talk about indigenous communists. And again, the record tells you pretty clearly what is meant. So for example, uh, Eisenhower and Dulles uh, deplored the fact that in Latin America, and in fact elsewhere, uh, the communists are, I'm quoting them, the communists are able to appeal directly to the masses. Uh, they have an ability to get control of mass movements, something we have no capacity to duplicate. <laughs> the poor people are the ones they appeal to, and they have always wanted to plunder the rich. Uh, so we've got this mass of poor people. That's a big problem of modern history, all history. You know, you've got all those poor people out there that are always trying to plunder the rich, and somehow the communists are able to appeal to them. We don't seem to be able to do that. We can't sell our own line that the rich should plunder the poor, kind of PR problem, you know, hire Edward Bernays or something like that. Uh, but uh, that's the problem. Uh, and uh, from that point of view, there are indeed many communists all over the place. And you've got to keep cutting them down, you know, and you've got to keep containing that threat, especially because there's huge mass of poor people everywhere trying to plunder the rich and all these guys appealing to them. I mean, that's exactly why, say, you know, a priest organizing a Bible study group in El Salvador became a communist. Uh, he, was a, he was trying to help the poor take control over their lives and so on, which would mean plundering the rich who own everything by right. Uh, it's why a couple of days ago, uh, the U.S. Senate, by a vote of merely 94 to 4, uh, uh, voted not to permit any further aid to go to Nicaragua uh, which, uh, unless, we, uh, unless Nicaragua returns the properties of uh, Somozists, what they say is American citizens whose properties were confiscated. But American citizens whose properties were confiscated are people who uh, uh, attained their wealth by part and property by participating in the robbery and the destruction of uh, Nicaragua for years under programs like the Alliance for Progress. That was all, Somoza was also considered an economic miracle except by the population. Uh, when they finally rose up and these properties were taken away, uh, and that's obviously a crime. They were plundering the rich. Uh, and unless uh, Nicaragua stops that crime and allows the rich to plunder the poor properly, uh, they aren't going to aid from us. Well, you know, this, uh, the, the depravity of this, in order to understand it, you have to remember the background. Uh, we, after all, destroyed the country. Uh, we uh, spent years running a murderous terrorist war uh, in which tens of thousands of people were slaughtered. And, then, and now, in fact, the country is down to the level of Haiti, literally. Uh, there are tens of thousands of children dying in the streets. Uh, they, in fact, appealed to the world court and won a court case against us and had a claim to reparations, but we kept the stranglehold on and said, drop that claim or you're dead. Uh, they finally dropped the claim under an arrangement by which the U.S. guaranteed to give them aid. A uh, little fact which has yet to make it into the newspapers. Uh, and uh, on that condition, they dropped the claim. Uh, we now cancel the aid uh, because they're still helping the poor plunder the rich. Well, that's the sense in which we've been defending uh, 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 the market and democracies from the communist threat. Uh, I can go on with many more examples, and you can too, so I won't bother anymore with that. But just comment, make, make an interesting, what seems to me an interesting comment about uh, our intellectual culture, the one in which we live. Uh, people can read and write uh, about our long-term policies of defending market democracy, and they can do it without laughing, without bursting out in hysterical laughter. And that's an interesting fact, actually, uh, because in order to be able to do that, you have to eliminate from your mind questions that would ar arise in the mind of any intelligent 10-year-old. 
like the ones I've asked. If we've been defending the threat of, uh, if we've been defending market democracy from uh, a, a global threat of communism, let's look at the facts, let's look at the cases and see how we did it, say in Brazil or Guatemala and Chile and Nicaragua and so on. Of course, as soon as you ask that question, the whole story collapses. But to maintain it, you just have to be sure you never ask the question. And it takes some doing to do that. You have to respect people who are able to do that, not to ask the kind of question that any child would think of in three seconds uh, and that we would instantly think of with regard to any other country. It takes quite a, a, a good educational system, places like MIT and Harvard and everything like it, to ensure that people are so totally deprived of the capacity to think that they can write sentences like that and read sentences like that and it can never occur to them to ask the simplest most elementary question which suffices in fact to make the whole thing collapse into hilarious laughter well that's an achievement and there aren't many countries that have done it especially under conditions of freedom maybe none uh, so we ought to be proud of ourselves. Well, let's drop the fraud about democracy and look at the market. There, there's some more interesting things to say, and we can go back to uh, Lincoln Gordon, the uh, Kennedy Johnson representative in Brazil, uh, who was telling us about the greatest victory for freedom in the mid 20th century, uh, and pointing out that this ought to uh, uh, improve the uh, climate for foreign investment. Now, when we say that U.S. policy is, has been an effort to uh, improve the market in that sense, it's at least partially true. Now we're entering the real world, but still only partially. Uh, what's true is that we do try to force, and with our, given our power, succeed in forcing uh, the third world. The third world now includes Eastern Europe back to its traditional third world status. That's basically what the Cold War was about. Uh, we, uh, have, we do, in fact, try to impose upon the third world and ultimately succeed, given the distribution of power. Uh, uh, we try to force them to adopt uh, market economies, and we do this with uh, many uh, impressive pieties about the marvel of the free market, and uh, if you're big intellectual, you talk about the comparative advantage and specialization and efficiency and all that kind of stuff that you know about. Uh, that's for others, however. That's where the story ends. That's for others, not for us. We don't believe in the market for ourselves, and we never have. Uh, NAFTA, which I'll get to in a moment, is a case in point. It's interesting that people who really do believe in free trade, there's a few of them out there, are generally opposed to NAFTA because it's so highly protectionist. In fact, it's, and, and, and if you listen to American corporation executives, they're for NAFTA for exactly that reason. I'll come back to that. Uh, in any event, it's typical in that we have never uh, accepted free trade for ourselves. It's something for other people to follow. Uh, you get a good example in this morning's New York Times. Might as well be up to the minute. If you take a look at the business section on the front page, uh, there's an article about another new Clinton policy. In addition to the reversal of our vision on foreign policy, we have a new, what's called a new national export strategy. And if you read the article, you'll discover that the new national export strategy um, uh, goes far beyond, I'm quoting the article, the less coordinated efforts of Reagan and Bush. Uh, they had a national export strategy, but now we're going to go way beyond it and have a more coordinated one. Not mentioned in this uh, uh, article, uh, and probably never reported there, is that the uh, national export strategy of Reagan and Bush were in violation of the rules of GATT, you know, the international trading uh, uh, rules uh, because they were illegal subsidies. And in fact, that, that was conceded by the U.S. government. Well, the head of the Export-Import Bank, federal agency that deals with these things, uh, conceded that the export strategy, which was uh, involved subsidies to U.S. corporations uh, operating abroad, was in violation of the GATT rules. So therefore, the new export strategy, which goes way beyond the old one, uh, is going to be radically in violation of the GATT rules. That is radically in violation of free trade. Uh, the uh, conceded violation during the Reagan years was part of the extreme attack uh, on economic liberalism that was carried out by the Reagan administration, uh, which combined two things. One, the highest level of rhetoric and memory about the wonders of free trade, and two, the sharpest attack on those principles and memory. 
In fact, James Baker, when he was Secretary of Treasury, uh, pointed out quite accurately that the Reagan administration had offered more protection uh, to American industrialists than all preceding post-war generations, which is quite true, for example, by doubling the, virtually doubling the uh, uh, percentage of imports subject to one or another form of barrier. In fact, they invented all kinds of new tricks to do this. Uh, but it wasn't enough, and now we have to go well beyond. Uh, and it's quite interesting to read the discussion. You read the discussion about it and say, this morning's time, to get a lot of insight into what markets are and are intended to be. So the t government, the US government and the New York Times, concede that we oppose the policies that we are now going to implement uh, even more uh, fully than before. And we oppose them because they amount to government subsidies that distort international markets. I'm quoting, and we're very much against that, as you know. Uh, that's why we're implementing the policy. Uh, well, we're against it when other people carry out those policies, but it's right for us to carry them out. And in fact, that's explained. Here's the explanation, quoting the uh, president of the Export-Import Bank. Uh, you gotta listen to this carefully, it's kind of subtle. By creating such a program in the United States, the Clinton administration will have more influence in seeking international limits on such programs. Get it? We're opposed to the programs because we're big, you know, free trade exponents. Therefore, we will institute programs which radically violate free trade because once we've done it, we'll be in a better position to influence others to drop the programs that we're opposed to. Well, you know, those of you who sort of follow these games will recognize the logic perfectly. Uh, there's a whole history of uh, being in favor of war because uh, it's going to bring peace, or uh, being in favor of crime because it's going to bring about law-abiding behavior, or being in favor of uh, increase in uh, military production and arms export because it's going to lead to uh, uh, a decline in military spending worldwide, and so on. Uh, you're all familiar with that, uh, and this is just another example. And there's some, you could put the thing in simple words. In simple words, it would say approximately anything goes as long as there's a good answer to the question, what's in it for us? Now, I didn't invent that night's phrase. I stole it from the Clinton administration and the New York Times. And it has to do with another aspect of the new Clinton doctrine, which has just been uh, put forth. In fact, it was presented the day after uh, the US vision of foreign policy uh, reversed. Uh, it was a report on a White House panel uh, on intervention, uh, which came up with a new proposal on it. We're going to have a new policy on intervention. The policy is, what is in it for us? Those are the words that are highlighted. In other words, we're going to abandon the altruism of the past uh, when we turn large parts of the world into graveyards and deserts. Uh, and from now on, we're going to ask, What's in it for us? That's the new vision. Uh, I also didn't quite give you the full report. Uh, the full report on the uh, U.S. vision of foreign policy reversed. I only quoted you some of the lines. Uh, the chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times who wrote that article under the heading U.S. vision of foreign policy reversed, Thomas Friedman, uh, cap he said the essence of the new policy is this. Uh, with the Soviet nuclear threat gone, where and how we intervene abroad is a matter of choice. That's the essence of it. In other words, now we understand what the global threat was. They had a deterrent, you know, and that prevented us from choosing where and how we were going to intervene. But now that the deterrent is gone, we really can reverse our policy. Uh, now we can intervene where and how we like, uh, and we will do it uh, when there's something in it for us. That's the two new policies. I think the technical term for that is politics of meaning, if I've understood modern, uh, <laughs> modern discourse properly. Well, uh, 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 actually, there's absolutely nothing new in any of this except one thing. We do, the US really does have greater freedom, has greater freedom to use its resources of violence and terror uh, to get what's in it for us. Uh, and we have to qualify a little, and I will in a moment, about what's meant by us. But let's hold that in the background for a minute. Well, uh, let's return to our attitude toward markets. Uh, again, the uh, New York Times is very helpful about this. 
they're very worried about the popular opposition to NAFTA. You know, they don't like it. They figure they're going to ram it right through. It was all done in secret. Nobody ever heard about it. You know, just as you heard, the same in the United States. It was kept secret. But somehow, you know, popular groups got wind of it and didn't like what they heard, and they made a fuss. So now you got a problem. Uh, so the New York Times, as its contribution to overcoming the problem, published on the front page what they called a primer on free trade, written by their economics correspondent, which is going to explain to sort of the ignorant fools why free trade is a good idea. And they had a couple hundred economists who signed a statement, and you know they quoted all the fancy big shots, including the ones here and everyone else. Uh, and the basic idea that came out was that it's been understood for 250 years uh, that free trade leads to a more efficient employment of productive forces. And in fact, you actually can prove a theorem to that effect under certain conditions, so the statement is true. Uh, and in fact, it's been true for 250 years. For example, it was true uh, in the early 19th century when the United States began its uh, uh, development as an industrial economy. And right around here, places like Lowell and Lynn and so on set up textile factories uh, which, of course, couldn't can begin to compete with British textiles. So therefore, you had to set up very high protectionist barriers uh, to allow them to develop. And uh, when they did develop, in radical violation of the most efficient employment of productive resources, uh, the lesson that was understood then as well as it is now, uh, that had side effects. I mean, after textiles, you had you know, small industries that were producing for the textile factories and so on. And by radically violating sound economic thinking, uh, the United States was able to begin its economic takeoff. Actually, this wildly understates the point. Remember that the Industrial Revolution was based on King Cotton. And remember how cotton became king, first by exterminating the indigenous population by state violence, and then by slavery. Well, that's rather serious intervention with free market forces. In both cases, the state was sort of doing something besides just kind of watching while the free market operates. Uh, but let's put aside King Cotton, which nobody talks about, uh, and just look at the protectionist barriers. I mean, there are economic historians who look at these things, and they've estimated that about 50% of New England industry, meaning US industry, that's all it was, New England industry in the, say, 1820s and 1830s, about 50% of it would have gone bankrupt instantly uh, if they had dropped the protective tariffs. Now, it's not that anything changed later on. Uh, later on in the century, the United, you know, things changed. We now have railroads and stuff want to develop the steel industry. Well, you can't compete with cheaper British steel. Uh, so therefore, high protective uh, tar uh, tariffs were set up to create the barriers that would permit uh, Andrew Carnegie to set up the world's first uh, billion dollar uh, uh, corporation, U.S. Steel. He also got a little help from the state in other ways, like sending in the National Guard to smash up workers who tried to keep their jobs. That's another way in which the state helped. Uh, and if you come up to the present, the story is exactly the same. I mean, everybody's got a computer on their desk. Why do you have a computer? Uh, because the public paid 100% of the costs of research and development in the 1950s when computers were too big and clumsy to sell. Uh, uh, that's called the Pentagon. Uh, that's the funnel by which the public funds research and development uh, uh, and production, in fact, creating a market for it if you can't sell it you know, because it's useful. Uh, it's called the Pentagon. Uh, Pentagon system. It includes you know, NASA, you know, Men on the Moon, and all this sort of business, and uh, uh, the Department of Energy, and so on. There's a network. That's our massive form of intervention in the market, which, in fact, gives you things like electronics industries and computers and uh, massive parallel processing in the last couple of years, which is a military uh, production, uh, uh, lasers, uh, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry works this way. In fact, everything does. It's hard to find a sector of the economy which isn't profitable because the public has paid the costs via the government in some fashion, the Pentagon or something else, uh, and then if something turned out to be marketable, you give it to private enterprise and then they make the profits. So the, you socialize the costs and you privatize the profits, it's called free enterprise, and it's done via radical state intervention. Uh, that's quite aside from things like protectionist barriers. We have a terrible record of protectionism right through the 1980s when in fact the US led the way, uh, and so on. Uh, the, uh, 
uh, in the, uh, no, well, that was the United States. Are other countries different? No, they're all exactly the same. Every, without, as far as I know, without a single exception, every country that developed did it this way. And that goes back to England, you know, the guy who started it all. Uh, they were able to develop by smashing up uh, Indian industry, uh, which was competitive with them uh, in textiles, in manufacturing, uh, building ships, uh, you know, all this sort of thing. But the British happened to have the guns, so they could destroy it. Uh, and they did. Uh, they destroyed it with what, things very similar to what we now call free market experiments. Well, you see the result. Uh, India deindustrialized, became more agricultural, became a deeply impoverished agricultural country by the time the British got out. England industrialized. Uh, they were aware of it. You know, you can read discussions in the House of Lords in you know 1850 saying that uh, uh, Dhaka, the uh, the Manchester of England. Uh, is now becoming a desert and a, you know, a slum. Uh, Dhaka is now the capital of Bangladesh, uh, a symbol of misery. Uh, when the British came in, it was regarded as a paradise, you know, uh, populous, wealthy, you know, very uh, uh, not only agricultural and other resources, but uh, industry by the standards of the day. Now it's Bangladesh. Actually, Haiti is exactly the same. It was also one of the first places, actually the first place colonized, that's where Columbus landed, and again described as a paradise, uh, perhaps the most populated area of the world, very rich, lots of resources. I mean, it helped lay the basis for the wealth of uh, France and Britain, uh, ended up being Haiti. Well, that story is duplicated all throughout the world. Uh, and there's some perfectly obvious lessons of economic history there. You want to develop, you'll do it this way. Follow the free market, and you'll end up like uh, uh, like the British experiment in Bengal, or uh, you know the local equivalent today. Uh, that's maybe the clearest uh, ele uh, lesson of economic history, and it explains why there's a kind of a double-edged attitude toward markets. Markets are fetters for the weak. The rich cast them off when they feel like it. Uh, there are times when the rich are willing to play with markets, namely when they're going to win. So, for example, Britain, which is a classic case, uh, while they were developing uh, their own industrial system, they smashed Indian industry, they actually smashed Egyptian industry uh, uh, and others. Uh, they weren't able to smash the United States because we were too strong. We had too many guns here so we could keep them out. Uh, but uh, they, that way they were able to develop by about the middle of the 19th century. They figured they could probably win. They were so far ahead of anybody else. They became enthusiastic advocates of free trade. And they stayed that way until they started running into Japanese competition in the 1920s, which they couldn't deal with. Uh, so they just closed off the empire. Uh, in 1932, the British essentially closed the empire to Japanese penetration. Uh, and that's one of the factors that led to the Second World War. And that's the way it is. If you're going to win, you like markets. If you're not going to win, you don't like them. Uh, uh, what's in it for us is the question that's asked. Uh, in the last decade, the rich countries, the OECD countries, have become considerably more protectionist. Uh, almost all of them. Uh, the United States most extreme in many ways, but all of them have become more protectionist. The third world, in contrast, has been subjected to what's called structural adjustment. About 75 countries have been subjected to these neoliberal market experiments. And you know, the results were completely predictable from a couple hundred years of history, but now they're in. Uh, the gap between the richest countries and the poorest countries has approximately doubled. Uh, and uh, for very clear reasons, not a big surprise. Uh, going back to the primer in the New York Times, uh, th there's a few things that were not there, surprisingly, like, for example, the things I've talked about. I mean, if these principles are immutable laws, you know, then how come they didn't apply throughout all of American history? You know, how come uh, it is not, why don't we conclude that the way things should have worked is that people like us ought to be pursuing our comparative advantage in exporting fur uh, while India or maybe Egypt or some other place should have been leading the Industrial Revolution, which is quite possibly what would have happened if market principles had applied. But the guys with the guns, we're not going to let them apply. Uh, and therefore, we're us, and India is India, you know, and Egypt is Egypt, and so on. Uh, well, that's uh, the way things have worked. Uh, and there are consequences right up until today, like take India, big country, you know, a lot of potential. Uh, and they do lots of things quite well. For example, seven out of 10 diamonds 
uh, in the world are cut in India. They're really good at that. Uh, it's quite profitable, too, because you can use super cheap labor, you know, in places where you can get workers for, like, nothing, you know, and then if they die, which they do pretty soon, they've got plenty more of them. Uh, uh, this is one of the results of the neoliberal programs that has been, in fact, this has been improving over the last 10 years thanks to these programs that, have, that India has been forced to adopt. And that has benefits, got its bright side. Uh, uh, the bright side was uh, described recently by a diamond exporter who said, we pass along some of the benefits to our overseas customers. The benefits are that now the extremely impoverished Indian workers are working for a fraction of what they used to thanks to the neoliberal programs. And we pass on those benefits so people benefit from them. Uh, what happens is the workers in India and their families starve to death in the new world order of economic rationalism, but diamond necklaces are cheaper in uh, elegant shops in downtown Boston and so on. Uh, that's uh, called economic rationalism, and that's in fact what you taught by the primer uh, that uh, uh, the New York Times had in the front page, but somehow these facts didn't seem to be there. I wonder why. Uh, now, so far, everything I've said has been a total mystification, and let me clear that up. I've been talking as if nations are agents in world affairs, uh, talking about what we do and what they do and so on. Uh, and of course, that's not true. In fact, I, I mentioned, say, these UN statistics on the doubling of the gap between the richest and the poorest countries in the last 30 years. If you look at the richest, you take the same statistics, and you look at the richest and the poorest people, you know, across the countries, you find that the gap didn't just double, it went far higher, you know. The gap between the richest and the poorest people went far higher, and in fact, about half of that, the, the, that gap is internal to particular countries, meaning the poor got poorer in the rich countries, and they got a lot poorer in the poor countries, and the rich got richer in the rich countries, and the rich got richer in the poor countries. That's what actually happened. Now, uh, all of this uh, has to do with, uh, uh, sort of a trivial fact, uh, namely nations aren't actors, countries aren't actors. Uh, rather, in any state, any country in which there's an internal concentration of power uh, of any kind, you can pretty well predict that the policy of that state is going to reflect uh, the people who have the internal power. It's going to reflect their interests. It's known as class analysis. Uh, uh, it was described quite eloquently by that famous radical Marxist revolutionary Adam Smith uh, in Wealth of Nations uh, when he pointed out in one of the many passages of Adam Smith that somehow don't appear in the readings that uh, although uh, mercantilism and colonialism were terrible things and very harmful, you know, grievous impact on the colonies and quite harmful to the people of England, uh, the principal architect, the, the merchants and the financiers who were the principal architects of policy with regard to them, he said their interests were most peculiarly attended to. In other words, they did very nicely. The guys who made up the policy, so in other words, the policies that we're supposed to hate were very good for the guys on top in England, and that's why they were instituted, uh, and they harmed everybody else in England, he claimed. Maybe so. Uh, that's one of the ways in which the poor subsidize the rich in the rich societies. Uh, and nothing changes until today. Uh, uh, the, uh, if we're just getting late, so I'll just mention a few things. But there are some major tendencies in the world economy reflecting these facts. It's not just that the rich uh, do what, you know, pursue poli the rich countries pursue policies on the basis of what's in it for us meaning we cast out market discipline if we don't like it, and we force market discipline on others, and we construct for them a kind of democracy in which, uh, which is top-down uh, and other control of people will serve our interests. It's not that the rich countries do that. Exactly the same thing goes on internal to the countries. Uh, and you can see it happening very visibly and very dramatically in the rich countries in the United States right now. Uh, particularly since 1970. Around then, there really was a major change in world order. It's a very significant one. And a lot of important things have happened since then, and NAFTA fits into this, so let me go on. Uh, since about 19, uh, 1970, the, the, the United States had been the sort of 
you know, kind of world banker up until then. There was an international economic system, the Bretton Woods system. The U.S. was the guarantor of it, given our enormous wealth. By about then, the U.S. couldn't handle it any longer. You know, other major centers of power. We were still by far the richest, but you know, Japan, the Japanese system, and the European system were competitors. Uh, the guys who run the thing, uh, who, who run the game, decide on the rules. Uh, so Nixon, President Nixon, decided to throw out the rules. Uh, the Bretton Woods system was dismantled uh, by unilaterally by the United States in the early 1970s. Uh, and that had a lot of consequences. Other things happened at the same time, but without talking about the details, one of the consequences was a huge increase in the amount of unregulated capital in the world. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Uh, the most recent World Bank estimate, again, just a few days ago, is $14 trillion of unregulated capital. I have a foggy idea what that number means, incidentally. I tell it to you, but I don't know what it means. $14 trillion, but I do know one thing about it, $14 trillion of unregulated capital means that the countries of the world do what they're told by international finance. So national banks in countries, say, Europe means European countries, not poor countries, can't defend their own currencies. Uh, the economic, the European monetary system just collapsed because it couldn't withstand uh, the attack of unregulated international capital. It's an open question whether even the rich country like the United States could withstand that pressure. Probably not, as many expect, uh, I think. Certainly third world countries haven't got a chance. So there's this huge amount of completely unregulated capital, very narrowly concentrated, like it's not that you know, the folks you run into in the street own it. Uh, uh, and it's quite international. You know, it goes anywhere it likes. With modern telecommunications, you can shift the currencies larger than the total reserves of some big country from one place to another in about two minutes and so on and so forth. Uh, that's one change. Uh, a second major change that has taken place in the last 20 years is a, ra a very sharp increase in the internationalization of production. Uh, it's connected with this. I mean, it's a lot easier to, to move production to high repression, low wage areas, you know, places like those diamond cutters in India. Much easier to do that and to do it for big manufacturing as well. That's connected with the easy flow of capital and the easy availability of it. Uh, in fact, that has reached such a point that, again, in a recent World Bank study, uh, foreign sales of transnational, uh, transnational corporations are now estimated to hold about a third of total productive assets. Assets, and the foreign sales of transnational corporations are now considerably greater than all of world trade. You know, so if you sort of like add up what Ford is selling abroad and so on, that number is, dominates world trade by a considerable factor at this point. This is a radical shift in what's happening in the world. Uh, furthermore, what's called world trade is itself a bit of a joke. Uh, something like maybe a third or 40 percent, something around that, of world trade is actually not trade at all. It's just intra-firm transactions. It's one branch of the Ford Motor Company moving something from one place to another and happening to cross a border. So that has nothing more to do with trade than if you own a grocery store and you move a can of beans from one shelf to another. It just happens by accident to cross a border. Now, those are not small numbers. That's estimated, as I say, well over a third of world trade. And that aside, uh, we're, even this phony notion of trade is itself dominated by foreign sales of uh, transnational corporations. Uh, furthermore, a third major point uh, is that with this huge increase in international capital, what it's being used for has shifted radically. Back around 1970, uh, about 90% of it, it's estimated, was used for um, a foreign exchange, was used for long-term investment and trade, you know, sort of productive things. 10% was used for speculation. Those figures seem to have approximately reversed. Uh, it seems now that about 90% is used for speculation and about 10% for long-term investment and trade. And many economists have suggested that, that, that these various things that I've described uh, are what lie behind some very important event developments that have taken place in the international economy in the last 20 years. For one thing, there's been a sharp slowdown of economic growth all over the world, you know, much lower than it was. Secondly, national economic planning is becoming virtually impossible uh, because of speculative attacks and internationalization of production. Uh, and third, the third world model is coming home. Uh, so as you shift production abroad, 
uh, trying to compete with those starving diamond cutters in India, or you know Mexican workers who are not going to get jobs from NAFTA. In fact, they're going to be flooded. You know, in fact, they'll probably end up with lower wages because part of this arrangement will wipe out agricultural producers uh, who won't be able to withstand what in effect are highly subsidized U.S. agribusinesses. Millions of them will flood to the cities. That gives you a huge labor market. The government's repressive enough so that it won't, you know, you try to organize a union, you get killed. Uh, so maybe they'll have jobs, but it'll be like these uh, Indian workers. Well, that's uh, what happens, but of course it comes home as well because the people in the rich countries who are trying to compete with them, they're driven down to that level. Uh, you're not getting harmonization. You, you might get a kind of harmonization of global standards, but it's harmonization downward under these conditions, not upwards. Uh, and under deflationary, non-stimulative, uh, uh, kind of low-growth equilibrium, which turns the whole world more and more into a sort of a two-tiered, third-world style society. Uh, American workers, for example, are becoming essentially superfluous product for production. Uh, and uh, they're also probably, although this is an open question, they might be becoming superfluous for consumption. Uh, in the days of a more national economy, say like the 1920s, Henry Ford understood that if you want to sell your, if you want to sell his cars, he better pay his workers, you know, five dollars a day. Otherwise, not, nobody's going to buy his cars. It's not so clear that that's still necessary in a more internationalized economy of the kind that I just described. The answer isn't in on that one. It may very well be possible, and that's certainly the direction we're going, to have internationalized production seeking the most highly repressed, lowest wage workers anywhere and orienting the production towards wealthy sectors uh, around the world, you know, Ford World Car. Uh, you know, the, the production is going to the rich, who in the rich countries are a fairly substantial number, and in the poor countries are a very small number, but they're all over the place, and they may turn out to be the market, in which case uh, you get exactly what you see when you take a walk in any American city. You see South Central Los Angeles, or you know, downtown Boston. People who are basically superfluous. It's not on the scale yet of the favelas around Rio or, you know, the slums around Cairo and so on. But the phenomenon is quite visibly growing. You can't miss it, you know. You see it everywhere. Uh, and you all know it, so I won't go on with, the, with it. Uh, furthermore, the guys in charge are quite aware of it and very happy about it. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, for example, had a front page article a couple of days ago in which they discussed some new statistics that had come along which they said are of transcendent importance. Well, not a little thing. Uh, what's of transcendent importance is that thanks to the attack on labor uh, in the last 10 years and the partial marketization of American society, meaning the poor play the market game, the rich have the state to protect them, the usual double-edged sword, thanks to this, they said U.S. wages have now fallen below every other country in the industrial world with the sole exception of England. Margaret Thatcher managed to do even a little better than we did. Uh, and that's really good, you know. I mean, we're the richest, most privileged country in the world, you know, and incredible advantages. And we succeeded in getting wages driven down lower than any of our competitors, except England. Uh, not quite down to the level of South Korea and Taiwan yet, they said. They were kind of trying, you know, to sort of keep after. And those are quite natural consequences of these uh, of these general long-term tendencies. So the diamond cutters may starve to death in India, uh, and the pe hundreds of thousands of children may starve to death in Brazil, but people here are going to, pre be, are going to be starving too. And in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, if, if you check cities like, say, Boston, a rich city uh, with big medical center, uh, the Boston City Hospital, which caters to the general public, was forced to uh, set up a malnutrition clinic a couple of years ago that treats third world level levels of malnutrition and has to use triage, you know, because they don't have enough resources. The problem, they say, becomes much worse in the winter when parents have to make that agonizing choice between food for your children and, you know, heat for your home, so they get more of it. Well, we're going to see more and more of that uh, because it's a kind of like a natural consequence of these policies. Markets for the poor, state power for the rich. It's an old story, but it's taken on quite new forms in the last years. 
Uh, and uh, again, the, uh, the business world is very clear about it. They're highly class conscious. They know exactly what they're doing. And fortunately, they write about it, so you don't have to make it up. You know, they tell you. You read the business press. It's right there. Uh, it takes a General Motors. Uh, we've already achieved this result of transcendent importance, but we want to go further. So let's take the biggest corporation in the U.S., General Motors. Well, as you know, they're planning to close down two dozen plants in the United States. They're already the biggest employer in Mexico, where they get very cheap and highly repressed workers who can't organize and so on. And a lot of people flooding from the farms will you know, take their places. Uh, but that's not enough. They want to go somewhere even better. Uh, so they're now starting to open up, to, to move plants to the new third world that's opening up thanks to the end of the Cold War. The end of the Cold War offers new weapons against Western working people, and it's well understood. It's this big new third world opening up. Uh, so GM, for example, has a new uh, $700 billion plant in uh, uh, East Germany. And if you look at the Financial Times, you know, the world's biggest best financial newspaper. They're very happy about it. They say they can get workers for 40% the wages of the pampered West European workers. You know, in Poland, thanks to harsh government repression uh, and market principles, they have what is called an economic miracle. And the people in Poland somehow can't even understand it, so they just voted the communists back in. But the West likes it, you know. Uh, and they'll follow it anyway, no matter who they vote in, because they're subject to these forces anyway. Uh, but now you can get really cheap workers there, well-trained, you know, educated. Uh, they also have the advantage of being blue-eyed and blonde, you know, so you don't have to worry about that stuff. Uh, and uh, I was talking about East Germany, sorry. Poland is even better. They have a plant in, I skipped the stage, they have a plant in East Germany where they get them at 40% of the wages of the pampered Western European workers, but then they open a new plant in Poland where they can get them for 10% of the pampered Western European workers. Uh, that's described in an article in the Financial Times with the title, Green Shoots in Communism's Ruins meaning communism is a wreck, but there's some really nice things going on there. There's some green shoots coming along, like the fact that you can get workers for 10% of the wages uh, of the pampered West European workers, and furthermore, the government has heavily repressive policies, so they'll keep them down, you know. I mean, they have a state, you know, which crushes them because that's what the market economics tells you you got to do. Uh, and that's great, so we have some green shoots there. Uh, the uh, uh, and they describe why. Here's the description. They say, with the market reforms that are being, inst the market reforms being instituted in Poland have led to pauperization of the workforce. Okay? They've led to pauperization of the workforce and large-scale unemployment, which makes it a great labor market. You know, yeah, finish in a second. Uh, because you don't have to worry about these pampered West European workers anymore. Uh, uh, Business Week uh, you know, picked it up and said, yeah, they taught the lesson. You've got to end the luxurious social programs, that's the phrase, that Western workers have been used to, you know, like they get vacations and you know, food and all that sort of thing. Uh, and they've got to live like the guys who we can grind into the dust, you know, uh, in the third world. That's the goal. Uh, uh, in brief, without going on, you, the idea is to put the screws on the poor at, abroad, as you always did, but now put the screws much more than, than you could before on the poor at home. You can do it both. That's one of the consequences of internationalization of labor. Well, uh, that's a few words. I'm supposed to talk about NAFTA. I'll say one word about it. Uh, <laughs> as I mentioned, NAFTA has the, a North American free trade agreement would be worth discussing. But the only thing in NAFTA that has to do with the North American Free Trade Agreement is the words North American. It's not free and it's not trade. It's highly protectionist. Uh, about 10% of the NAFTA, those 2,000 pages, are devoted to very complicated rules of origin uh, conditions which give all sorts of advantages to what they call North American-based, meaning U.S.-based corporations. Uh, they can sort of beat up their rivals in Asia and Europe, and of course it will drive them to setting up regional uh, uh, systems as well, which will harm the workers, but aren't going to harm the corporations, because, you know, like uh, Xerox Corporation, I heard a guy from Zenith the other day on NPR 
talking about how fantastic NAFTA was because it was going to be so protectionist, you know, we'll keep out the Europeans and the Japanese, and of course, sooner or later, the Europeans and the Japanese will retaliate, and that will harm the workers in North America, but it's not going to harm him because he already has factories inside those systems. Uh, so that's the meaning of the transnationalization of production. So you just get another device for beating down the poor in the rich societies as well as in the poor societies. Uh, quite apart from that, uh, NAFTA is highly protectionist in other ways. Uh, uh, Hilda mentioned intellectual property rights. That's an extremely important matter. That's a U.S. initiative, both in NAFTA and GATT, and it means raising protectionist barriers to ensure that the technology of the future, meaning the profits of the future, is protected, is monopolized by U.S. corporations. And those are no small thing. I mean, the international, U.S. International Trade Commission, U.S. agency, estimates that uh, could cost the third world about $60 billion a year if these rights are instituted in GATT, as they already are in NAFTA. But that's protectionism. I mean, like the U.S. never accepted such rules when it was a developing society, nor has any other country, like Germany or Japan. Or no, no, I mean, nobody ever dreamt of that. But now we're on top, right? So therefore, we ran it down their throats. Uh, we want to force India to be, not to be able to produce drugs at, say, 10% the cost of American drugs. Rather, their children have to die of diseases or else somehow those diamond workers have to figure out how to buy our super expensive drugs, which are subsidized by uh, things like the MIT Biology Lab, uh, where the research is done and then, you know, you get uh, the profits go off to the pharmaceutical companies if there are any. Uh, well, I, I won't go on, but if you go through it point by point, you find it's a highly protectionist system. It's designed to protect investor rights, not workers' rights, not the rights of future generations. It's called the environment. It's a special system designed to protect the rights of investors, a kind of a mixture of liberalization and protectionism, carefully geared to investor rights. It's got nothing to do with the free trade agreement. Uh, for the, uh, uh, neither free, as I say, nor trade. I mean, it's talking about services, meaning putting banks in third world countries, uh, it's nothing to do with trade, uh, patents, it's nothing to do with trade. Uh, these are just uh, further ways of crushing, of, of seeing what's in it for us, where us, now we understand, means the principal architects of policy in Adam Smith's sense, that is, the guys who run the rich societies. They ask what's in it for us, and they got a whole lot of new mechanisms to achieve their goal. Well, uh, there is a fundamental question. The question is, how far can this go? Uh, how far will it really be possible to construct an international society on what is, in effect, the third world model? That is, islands of wealth and, you know, sea of misery. Uh, and to do it within a kind of a totalitarian system, because notice that all these systems of control are immune to public influence and knowledge. You cannot know what's going inside a transnational corporation, nor what's going on inside their institutions, like the IMF or GATT or uh, G7 you know, executive agreements. All secret. You've got the ultimate move in destruction of democracy. Not only has the public have no influence on the decisions that are being made, they don't even know about them. That was the that was what was so symbolic about keeping NAFTA secret. You know, totally secret, obviously important, nobody knew, kept secret. Well, that's the way the new governing institutions work, corporations in law and principle, and the new organizations that are growing up around them, in fact. So will it be possible to set up a world in which you have, in effect, a kind of, you know, a deep kind of totalitarianism, maybe under an electoral facade, you know, for the kind of democracy that Carruthers talks about in Central America, we could keep here too. Uh, or will popular resistance, which increasingly is going to have to be international in scale, so it's going to have to be Mexican and Americans together working on these things just as the enemy is international, will it be able to uh, somehow dismantle these evolving systems of domination and violence? Uh, those seem to me the really big questions for the future. Thanks.
Por lo tanto, consideramos que este acuerdo no solo no consultó organizaciones sociales, sino a otros sectores importantes de la sociedad. That's why we think that this accord um, did not only um, uh, consult with um, the popular organizations, but with society in general. Una vez que conocimos su contenido, realizamos críticas al mismo. Once we found out about the content of the accords or of the agreement, we made criticisms of said um, accords. Pensamos que el Tratado de Libre Comercio va a beneficiar fundamentalmente al capital transnacional. We think that the free trade agreement is principally going to benefit um, multinational capital. Toda vez que no ha tomado en cuenta las grandes diferencias que existen entre nuestro país y Estados Unidos y Canadá. It hasn't taken into account the great differences between our society and that of the United States and Canada. Los pequeños y medianos industriales en México están preocupados también por el tratado. Small and medium size entrepreneurs in Mexico are also very worried about the, the treaty. Porque ellos no están preparados ni tecnológica ni con capital ni con capacitación suficiente para competir con estos capitales transnacionales. Because they are not prepared with capital or with training or technology to compete with these transnational uh, corporations. Y es posible entonces que el empleo del que se habla que se va a crear en México con el Tratado de Libre Comercio and it's possible then that the jobs that they're talking about which are being, going to be created with this free trade vaya acompañado también de grandes tasas de desempleo por estas industrias que van a quebrar will be accompanied by great unemployment uh, on, in these industries that are going to go broke de hecho en nuestro país durante este año han cerrado gran número de empresas manufactureras In fact, this year, the Mexican government has, with relation to the North American Free Trade Agreement. Y expresarles que hay una parte de la sociedad mexicana que no estamos de acuerdo con los términos actuales de ese tratado. And express to you that there is a part of the Mexican society that is not in agreement with the terms of that accord. Yo pertenezco a una red de organizaciones sociales. I belong to a network of social organizations. Que tenemos dos años trabajando en torno a NAFTA. And we have been working for two years with regard to NAFTA. El primer trabajo que nosotros hicimos fue tratar de averiguar qué estaba pasando con el acuerdo de comercio. The first thing that we tried to do was try to find out what was happening with the, the Commerce Accord. Cuando los gobiernos de Estados Unidos, México y Canadá anunciaron que se firmaría, se entraría en una negociación de un tratado de libre comercio. When When the governments of the United States, Canada, and Mexico announced that they were going to start a uh, dialogue about a free trade agreement, y que fue dado con gran publicidad en nuestro país, which was um, greeted with great publicity in our country, al mismo tiempo empezamos a carecer de información concreta. At the same time, we started to suffer from a great lack of information. El grueso de las negociaciones del tratado fueron hechas en secreto. The majority of the negotiations were uh, done in secret. Acompañar de una gran publicidad pero carentes del contenido concreto de lo que se estaba negociando accompanied by a great deal of publicity which totally lacked content about what was being negotiated por eso una de las primeras críticas que nosotros hacemos a este tratado that's why one of our first criticisms of this treaty es que no cuenta con un consenso social is that it doesn't have a social consensus ni de la sociedad de Estados Unidos, ni de Canadá y tampoco de México. From Amer U.S. society or Canadian society or Mexican society either. Many manufacturing companies in our country have closed. Porque no tienen suficiente calidad para competir con los productos que entran del extranjero. Because of lack of ability uh, or of quality standards to compete with products that come in from the exterior. Otro asunto que nos pareció crucial en relación al texto del tratado es lo que se refiere a la agricultura. Another crucial point which we considered uh, in the uh, agreement had to do with agriculture. Fue pedido por muchas organizaciones campesinas que los granos básicos como el frijol y el maíz no entraran en la negociación del tratado. Many campesino organizations, peasant organizations, uh, asked or had the opinion that the issue of um, basic grains, uh, beans and rice should not uh, be included in the, uh, the dialogue for the agreement. 
porque se trata de un problema de autosuficiencia alimentaria y para muchos de ellos de subsistencia. Because it's a problem of food self-sufficiency and for many of them subsistence. Lo único que se logró en el cuerpo de tratado fue que para esos granos se dieran los plazos más largos que son 15 años. The only thing that was accomplished was that with regard to basic grains there were there were longer uh, time limits given that is 15 years. El funcionario encargado en México del programa social declaró recientemente The official uh, in Mexico in charge of the social program recently said que, va, que se necesitarían 25 años para sacar al campo del mexicano de la crisis en la que se encuentra. That you would need 25 years to get the Mexican countryside out of the crisis in which it finds itself now. De tal manera que el campesino mexicano va a llegar 10 años tarde al Tratado de Libre Comercio. In such a manner, the campesino... I'd like to introduce a very special guest here tonight. Her name is Ilda Salazar, and she's a long-time advocate of workers' rights, and environmental protection in Mexico. Now she's working with a thought in Mexico, the Authentic Labor Front, which is the largest independent labor organization in Mexico, no small feat in a country dominated by labor unions that are dominated by the, the corrupt government of Mexico. She's also now working with the Mexican Action Network on Free Trade, which is a coalition over 100 organizations, labor, environmental, and other popular organizations that are working to define what free trade should mean and working to negotiate those trade policies throughout the hemisphere. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming our special guest tonight, Ilda Salazar. I would first of all like to thank al MIT y a las compañeras de casa por haberme invitado en esta ocasión MIT and the compañeras from casa for having invited me inviting me to um, address you on this occasion que es un tiempo muy importante porque estamos entrando a la recta final de aprobación del NAFTA. This is a very important time because we're starting in the final approval process of NAFTA. Pero también porque me siento muy honrado en compartir el auditorio. Because uh, also because I feel very honored to share this auditorium. Del maestro Chomsky. With Professor Chomsky. Quisiera yo hablar de un punto de vista diferente al del gobierno mexicano en relación al Tratado de Libre Comercio. En la búsqueda de esta información, nosotros entramos en contacto con grupos de Canadá. En search for this information, we have entered into contact with groups from Canada. Y ellos nos contaron su experiencia en la firma de un Tratado de Libre Comercio entre Estados Unidos y Canadá. And they told us about their experience with regard to the signing of the treaty between Canada uh, and the United States, the, the, the free trade agreement. Y ellos confirmaron que gran parte de la sociedad canadiense había sido afectada por ese tratado. And they confirmed to us that a great part of uh, Canadian society was affected by that agreement. Particularmente en lo que se refiere a sus empleos. Especially with regard to their jobs. Pero también en relación al medio ambiente. But also with regard to the environment. Y empezamos entonces una lucha por tratar de conocer cuáles eran las negociaciones del tratado e influir en sus decisiones. So we started to begin a struggle to understand the content of what was being negotiated in the treaty and to have an effect on those negotiations. El Tratado de Libre Comercio para México empezó a adquirir más y más importancia. The um, North American Free Trade Agreement started to uh, have more and more importance. Allá a estas alturas se ha convertido en la política macroeconómica más importante del gobierno de Salinas. And at this point it has become the most important macroeconomic uh, 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 politics or policy of the Salinas government. No fue sino hasta año y medio después que nosotros pudimos acceder a un borrador del tratado. It was not until a year and a half after it started that we could even get a rough draft of the treaty. Y que nos fue proporcionado por compañeros de Estados Unidos y Canadá. Which was given to us by our uh, colleagues in the United States and Canada. De parte del gobierno mexicano no hemos podido todavía obtener información. We have, still haven't been able to get information from the Mexican government.